dear to us, it gives us the capacity and ability to be able to witness to others who've gone through similar things, to be able to encourage believers who've suffered likewise. Brian's dad, um, we were all praying for him a while back for his cancer problem, and uh, he was telling me, you know, now that he went through cancer, he has ability to witness to people who've had cancer like he never had before. He's gained a whole new personal insight into the realm of having cancer. And um, as far as uh, on a different level, when um, I was back in college, when it was uh, between my sophomore and junior year, um, my little baby sister was born. She was born at the beginning of my, uh, actually it was beginning of my, end of my junior second semester. Between junior and senior year then it must have been. Well, uh, she went to be with the Lord about two months, five days after she was born, and God used that in my life to really help me to be able to understand what people are going through when they lose someone who's very dear to them. God uses these things in the heart of us as believers to make us more fit vessels for His service. God wouldn't put His children through something just so they could suffer for the fun of it. When a blacksmith wants to make a great sword, he can't just pour the sword into a mold and let it settle. That would be cheap pop metal and it would break easily. For a sword to be strong, the blacksmith takes the bar and pounds it, pounds it, heats it up till it's glowing hot, pounds it flat, pounds it some more, and then puts it in cold water. Then he reheats it back up, pounds it again puts it in cold water. Again and again this process is repeated till the sword takes on the shape it needs to be and then the sword is sharpened and becomes a useful tool. Without the heat, without the pounding, without the immersion in the cold water, the sword cannot be strong. The heat brings out the impurities and allows the metal to become malleable. The pounding compacts the metal and strengthens it. When the metal, the hot burning metal, is dipped in the cold water suddenly uh, if I remember right, it's carbonized to a degree. It becomes harder and stronger as it's uh, chilled. I don't understand the process thoroughly. If I'm mistaken, uh, please let me know, and um, then we'll all know better. But uh, we as believers cannot be all God wants for us if we, uh, if we never go through any hard times. Well, we see uh, in chapter 4, verse... 16 through 17, the Bible says, For which cause we faint not, but though our inward, outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which was but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at those things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we see here in verse 18 the contrast between time and eternity, between the here and the forever. And uh, in verse 17 we see the things we're going through, our light affliction. The Apostle Paul calls getting rocks thrown at him till he's pretty much dead, he calls that light affliction. Floating around in the ocean for a night and a day he calls light affliction. Getting beaten five times and then several times with rods and these other things, Paul calls it light affliction. He calls it light affliction to sit in the dungeons, the Roman dungeons, and uh, to suffer there. All this is light affliction because, well, he sees eternity. It's like a runner in the middle of his race. It's not too bad to be going through the race when you see the finish line at the end and know that you're the winner. Well, we see also that God's grace is sufficient. We read the verse earlier. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made purpose in we per perfect in weakness. God's strength can be poured through us as believers. If um, I were to have a clay jar up here, I don't, but if I were to, and it were whole, this clay jar would not pour much through it. If I knocked little holes in this clay jar, it would be able to pour through the water better. And so when we as believers have holes in our lives, when our lives are broken, when they're not what we think they ought to be, when they're not whole the way we would expect or the way our lives would be desired, God is able to pour His Holy Spirit through us to work in the lives of those around us. Wholeness is not what the Christian life is all about. Wholeness, that is, of our own self. There is great 
and complete wholeness and satisfaction in Christ, not with the things of the world, but with Christ himself. The book of uh, 1 Corinthians also provides a pattern for repentance and biblical restoration. This is very important because uh, in 1 Corinthians there is an individual who is sinning grievously with his mother-in-law, his father's wife, and um, not his mother-in-law, his father's wife. That's not the mother-in-law. Um, chapter 2, verse... Uh, let's see. For sake of time, I'll only read several of them. Verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Verse 6, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and to comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. This man's repented of his sin. He stopped the sin and he's repented of it. And the Apostle Paul tells the church, Bring him back into restoration. Bring him back into fellowship. Chapter 7, verse uh, 7 through 16. We won't read the whole portion for sake of time, but uh, the Bible says, um, For godly sorrow worketh, uh, chapter 7, verse 10, worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For the selfsame thing, ye have sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all these things ye have approved yourselves clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. And it says, Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. They'd gotten things right. They'd repented thoroughly and clearly. Um, this repentance it talks about in uh, chapter 7, verse 9, is not the repentance from lostness to salvation. This is repentance in a believer's life of sins. Um, when we as believers don't get things right in our lives it does affect more than just us it affects our believers around us it affects our church and the sin at the church of Corinth was destroying the whole church the church didn't have God's power in it things were going crazy in the church and perhaps the worst of all the sins was the one mentioned which uh, brought the apostle Paul a severe um, call for discipline on the individual but the church got things right. And um, this brought great comfort to the Apostle Paul and to Titus, his fellow laborer. Chapter, I'm sorry, Roman numeral 3, outline. There's a, This is a very basic outline of the book of 2 Corinthians. It's just uh, really to provide a quick handle to the book. It's not a thorough outline. If you want a more thorough outline, um, we could get you one. But, uh, this is a good and quite workable outline, and uh, you remember it like this, the ministry and the minister. The ministry, chapters 1 through 9. The minister, chapters 10 through 13. The ministry, uh, capital letter A of comfort, capital letter B of the gospel, and capital letter C of giving. The first chapter is the ministry of comfort. Chapters 2 through 7 is the ministry of the gospel. Chapters 8 and 9 is the ministry of giving. Chapter 10 through 13. If you'll look at your notes there, you'll see where it says, like, Roman numeral 1 again. Go ahead and stick another little I next to that, please. Tis but a minor formatting error. Um, next to the minister, you'll see there is no Bible reference. Please jot, if you will, chapters 10 through 13 there. Tis yet another minor formatting error. Um, chapters 10 through 13. We see about the minister, the Apostle Paul himself, this final chapters are especially focused on uh, the defense of his uh, apostolic authority is commended by God. In chapters 11 and 12, he shows the proof of his authority. And in chapter 13, 
and he gives a final